Thank you very, very much indeed to the Studium General and the University of Utrecht for inviting me here. It's an absolutely amazing space, very, very inspiring. So I hope I can use our time in this space to inspire you as well to think uh, in a different way, actually, um, about really the way we live and the way we shape our lives through food. Now, there should be an image here, which there isn't, so I'm slightly perplexed about that as well, but maybe if I, that's weird, there's just a whole image missing off this. There should be a picture here. Um, the, the image that, that appears not to be a, able to be shown to you is of, um, it's of Siena in 1338 in the 14th century, and it's, it's Ambr I will at least show you what it's called. It's called The Allegory of the Effects of Good Government. Um, and it shows, some of you may know it actually, it shows um, the city of Siena to your left. You can go home and look this up in, you know, on Google or something. And to the right it shows a very, very beautifully manicured Italian landscape. Uh, a bit like, actually, the view out of the town hall of Siena today. Um, and the beautiful thing about this image that you'll just have to imagine is that um, it's all about food. And I remember going to visit Siena in, in the 14th century. Does anybody actually know this image that I'm talking about? Do you stick your hands up? Oh, quite a lot. Oh, well, six. Great. Fantastic. So this is really working for you. No, no. Um, basically, it's, it's, it's a very powerful image because it actually, the allegory of the effects of good government is specifically talking about the relationship that I'm going to try to sketch in a lot more for you tonight, which is the relationship between the city and the countryside. And if you go home later and look this image up, what you will see is that it's really all about food. You know, you can see huntsmen leaving the city to go and shoot a boar for dinner. You can see how beautifully manicured the landscape is. And you can see asses coming into the city with, with sacks of grain on their backs. Um, and as I say, it, I remember going and seeing this image when I was, was an architecture student. Uh, and just thinking, that's nice. Well, very nice, but I didn't think anything particularly else about it. Uh, and it was only when I started this kind of bizarre thing of trying to work out how you might understand a city through food that I saw it in a completely different way. And I now think it's, maybe it's just too important to show up on the screen, but I now think it's actually uh, an extraordinary, unique image in, in that it's a very rare moment in time when a, a sort of a city government has explicitly shown the fundamental relationship between city and countryside, which is really the basic, uh, <laughs> the basic relationship in, in civilization. So just, I, I, can I just recommend you go and look it up later and note down the name. Um, anyway, that, if you like, was the 14th century version of what I'm showing you on the screen now, um, which is uh, what I call the urban paradox, as Rick said in his introduction. I call it that because Basically, as humans, we have two sets of needs. We have social needs. In other words, you know, we need to be close to each other in order to be... Sorry, I'm not going to do a strategy, I promise. I'm just suddenly getting quite hot. Anyway, um, <laughs> it's the weirdest lecture of my life so far. Um, <laughs> um, it's it's a, the fundamental relationship that was so visible, visible to the 14th century city, and is so invisible to us now, which is the relationship between these kind of clusters that we live in, increasingly cities. I mean, I, I'm sure I don't have to tell you that a few years ago, for the first time in history, more people were living in cities than in the countryside. This is a fundamental shift in the way we live. Um, and unlike the Sienese that could look out of their window and see a beautifully manicured, manicured landscape, which was feeding them, uh, and the whole point being, you know, the allegory of the effects of good government is if the city looks after the countryside, the countryside will look after the city. The two are seen as indivisible. We now have this bizarre situation where 
the way that relationship works is so distant, we're so disconnected from it that it's invisible to us, we can't see it. So I'm trying not to say anything ironic, but everything I say is ironic given that the visible was invisible, but that's fine, I won't refer to it again. Is, is, is the sound all right, by the way? Good, oh, good. Um, so the paradox is, um, as I say, that we have these two sets of needs. We need one another, we need sociability, but we also need sustenance, and that comes from the natural world. And the more we cluster together in cities, the more removed we be become from this other essential relationship that we have, which is with nature. Uh, and the kinds of denatured landscapes that we're creating in order to feed this urban habit that seems to be ever-increasing are very, very artificial. I mean, this, this, this image that, I don't know whether it's helpful to point at it or not, no, probably not. But, um, you know, the kind of landscapes that you can see to the right where essentially we have, you know, a phalanx of machines being driven by a helicopter reaping the land, and then very often there will be a sort of phalanx of seed drills coming up behind so the land gets about half an hour of downtime. Is the kind of way we've, we've evolved or are evolving to feed uh, urban populations. The paradox is that there's no sort of ideal way of resolving these two sets of needs because the closer together that we live, as I say, the further and further away we get from nature. And if we go to the other extreme and imagine that we just sort of decided to sort of go back to living on the land, which of course we can't because there's too many of us now, um, we don't have the proximity of other people. So it's a kind of so, sort of distributional issue to which there is no ideal solution. Now, how did we get here? So I'm just, is that buzzing? What is that buzzing? Is, is, it, is, it, is it me? <laughs> Should I? <laughs> and it doesn't worry me if it doesn't worry you, but that's better. It's beautiful. Thank you. Um, how did we get here? Now, I, mean, I, I usually like to sort of go back to the beginning of things. In this case, the beginning really is about 10,000 years ago, as you can see from this image, an image of the Fertile Crescent, so named because it, is, it, it consisted, effectively, of a crescent-shaped area of very fertile land. In fact, it was the model for the Garden of Eden. Um, and at the end of the last ice age, about 10,000 years ago, as the ice went north, the animals that people had habitually hunted and lived off were migrating north with them. And effectively, there was a, a food crisis in this area. And people began to experiment with new ways, new sources of food, uh, one of which was grain. So in this crescent-shaped area, the ancient antecedents to modern wheat and barley occurred. Um, and people began to experiment whether it not, wasn't natural to them to eat grass, uh, and it was, in fact, very, very difficult to harvest because you had to be in the right place at the right time for when it sort of became edible. Uh, so people began to camp next to the fields. If, well, they weren't really fields then, just naturally, natural grasslands. And slowly these evolved into, if you look up the eastern side of the Mediterranean, this is kind of your way around, um, those kind of triangular-shaped uh, settlements were very, very early sort of semi-agricultural, still semi-hunting sort of hunting and gathering communities from about 10,000 years ago. Um, and then they evolved sort of bottom right, your way around there, um, into a series of settlements that were complicated enough to be considered cities. And I mean, the real point about this image that I want to sort of uh, make clear is that uh, static sort of uh, human communities grew up around a new source of food, which was grain, which had to be harvested in one place at one particular time. And so they had to stay put. They couldn't wander off and follow their food around as hunters and gatherers did. Um, and secondly, uh, cities evolved in order to exploit this new food source. So really, agriculture and cities co-evolved from the beginning. And you can't actually have cities without agriculture. And in fact, grain is the only food we've still yet to discover any other food which is capable of feeding large static and mainly non-food producing populations. So grain is the food of cities. Now, if we look at how these very first cities uh, solved the problem of feeding themselves, uh, we notice several things. If we look at the city of Ur, 2000 uh, years BCE, 
uh, what we can see is that it's on a river. I mean, that's, that's a sort of very, very basic thing. All uh, early cities were close to or on water, the reason being that the water brought nutrients, it also brought, allowed, I mean, this region, it brought fertility and allowed them to store the water and use it for irrigation over the course of the year. It's a very small city, it's only about half a kilometer across at its greatest width. It's extremely dense. If you look at that sort of funny little patch of excavated residential area territory, you get an idea of how densely inhabited the whole city was. Um, and the farmland is surrounding the city, and in the middle you can see the large temple complex which dominates the city. And in fact, the temple not only uh, was the spiritual center of the city, but it was also the administrative center, and it was responsible for bringing in the harvest, uh, offering it up to the gods on the famous ziggurat, that some of you may know, um, storing it in the large municipal granary. I don't know whether you can make out, but in that temple complex, sort of directly to the right-hand side or your way around there, um, is a large square building, which is the municipal granary. Uh, and then next to it were the temple bakeries, where the, the grain was then taken and turned into bread and then handed out back to the people. And in fact, Sir Leonard Woolley, who was the, person, the first person to excavate her in the 1920s, he remarked when he was excavating the temple buildings that they looked more like a kitchen than a temple because it was so much to do with food. So really, how the first cities on Earth solved the problem of feeding themselves was by being on a river and by being a very dense, compact blob of urbanity, if you like, surrounded by productive hinterland with a large, spiritualized food distribution hub in the middle. So that's, that's model number one, if you like. And I could now probably go on and show you hundreds of other examples of cities that adopted a similar pattern but we don't have another week. <laughs> so I won't do that. But what I will do is say that very famously and interestingly, there was one city that completely bucked the trend. It went the other way. And of course, famously, that's Rome. Rome had a million citizens by the first century AD. Clearly sort of just, you know, popping out next door and farming wasn't going to feed a million people. And so the interesting question arises, how did a city such as Rome feed itself uh, in the pre-industrial era? And uh, the answer is food miles. Has everyone here heard of food miles? I mean, I think they're a fairly familiar concept. No, no, they're not. Okay, well, I mean, food miles is a recent concept, but it basically describes simply the amount of distance that food travels before it reaches us. Uh, it's actually coined by Professor Tim Lang in the UK, who's a, a very, very... Um, important figure in the emergent food movement globally, actually. Um, and of course, it refers to the fact that I was showing in my earlier slide that, you know, very often we live thousands of miles from our sources of food, and it's seen as a very modern phenomenon. I mean, what you discover, which is very interesting if you look at the example of Rome, is that it's not modern. It says what happens when cities outgrow their local hinterlands. And in fact, the only way a city could grow beyond a certain size in the ancient world was to have access to the sea. Because if you think of the problems of feeding a city, we've just talked briefly about growing the food, and I've said that grain is the only food we've ever discovered capable of feeding cities. But secondly, the problem of transport. How do you actually physically get the food from where you've grown it to the city? Now, the only way of doing that in the pre-industrial, the ancient world, uh, was by sea, because it was about 50 times cheaper to transport food over sea than over land. And so it was cheaper for Rome to import its food, as you can probably see from this map. If you look at the kind of um, the grain areas, which I've just marked in sort of spots, you can see that sort of to the south and to the west of Rome, Sicily and Sardinia were two countries that the city conquered very early on, actually, um, you know, about 146 BC. It was already... Uh, extracting grain from those islands in the form of taxes, and then that wasn't enough space, so it defeated Carthage and started importing grain from North Africa. And then when that wasn't enough, and it's very famous, you know, the, all the Antony and Cleopatra stuff, um, Augustus eventually went down into Egypt, conquered Egypt, and they arose, the city exported 6,000 farmers with a kind of military backup to basically get the grain production going big scale in Egypt. So Egypt was Rome's breadbasket. And the routes that you can see coming back through the Mediterranean and back up to Rome were 
the super tankers of their day, basically, the Alexandrian grain ships. And it's absolutely fascinating if you study the way, way, the way Rome fed itself because um, there are so many parallels with the way we feed ourselves now. And again, I could go on at extreme length about this. It's fascinating. But I mean, again, just sort of one or two ideas to take from this is that, you know, Rome had an enormous productive hinterland. It would have been impossible to have supported another city of the same size in that region. It was even importing oysters from Britain at one point. Uh, you can see from the map, you know, wine, oil, ham, and all of these things. Interestingly, also, the uh, Roman emperors fed up to 250,000 of the Roman citizens living in the city with a free grain dole called the Ananar. And this was seen as the emperor's responsibility, and it was extremely politically fractious. You know, everyone in Rome lived in very cramped and bad conditions. And if there was any threat to the grain supply, it was immediately referred up and the senators were assaulted in the forum and so on. So the relationship between food and politics in Rome is extraordinarily clear. I mean, just one final thing to say is that the continual expansion of the empire was necessary to keep feeding the city's appetite and arguably Rome effectively in the end ate itself to death. I think that's an entirely defendable uh, you know, sort of way of seeing the expansion and eventual decline of the empire. So that was quite a lot about Rome. Now, I mean, the interesting thing is that, you know, what we discovered from that slide we were just looking at is that the sea was absolutely essential to growing a city growing beyond a certain size in the pre-industrial world. And the first person to really kind of look intensively at why that was was Johann von Thunen, who in 1826 wrote a, a book called The Isolated State. The Isolated State is shown in the sort of um, the left-hand side of the picture you can see. It represents a featureless, fertile plain, a flat fertile plain uh, around the pink blob in the middle, which is the city, um, inhabited only by logical profit-seeking farmers. So it's a sort of fictional country that I expect probably rather resembles the Netherlands about 200 years ago. Um, anyway, and he said, if a city was surrounded by farmland in this way, how would its productive hinterland naturally evolve? And he said, well, obviously you would have market gardening, i.e. fruit and vegetable growing close to the city or indeed in the city, uh, for various reasons. One, fruit and vegetables are a luxury food, so the farmers get a lot of profit from selling it, so they can afford the high land rents that they'd have to pay close to the city. Secondly, fruit and vegetables are very difficult to transport long distances. They squash and they go off, so you want them close by. And last but not least, of all farmers, they were the most able to make use of human and animal manure, which was very carefully collected in the pre-industrial city and dumped on the land as fertilizer, uh, because by planting a cucumber or rhubarb in a particular way in a lovely pile of manure, you could bring it on and make it sort of come right two or three weeks ahead of season, for which people would pay ridiculous amounts of money. So we've effectively got, really, again, I mean, many things in food repeat in really fascinating ways. I mean, you could say, arguably, paying for out-of-season food that tastes of shit is something we also do today. Um, anyway, so that was, that was the inner ring. Then there was about a, a 20 uh, or 30 kilometer band of grain production of various kinds. Of course, grain being the most important food for cities, as I was saying. The limit was that after about 20 miles or 30 kilometers, it was no longer economically feasible to bring the grain into the city because of the enormous high costs of land transport. Simply grain is very heavy and bulky in, in respect to its value. So that would have doubled its cost. And he reckoned beyond that it would have been uneconomic. No farmer would have bothered. Nobody would have paid the prices. And therefore, the size to which the city could grow was limited by this factor. And then on the outer ring, you can see um, the green band is livestock grazing. And the reason for this, obviously, is that animals can walk, and therefore they can provide their own transport into the city. Uh, and so they can be actually reared a long way away. And indeed, this is the case if we look at London or indeed Rome. Their meat was uh, raised in Scotland for London and Apulia for Rome, so over 500 miles away in each case. Um, 
So that was, that was kind of, if you like, sort of his description of how he thought the productive hinterland of a city would naturally develop. The only concession he made to geography, and I say he was German, so he didn't really think particularly in terms of seafaring, was on the, that side for you, where you see the river. He basically said if a city was on a navigable river, then all of those grain and other producing areas could extend a lot further away because it was a lot cheaper to bring the food in by water. Um, and in fact, you know, I remember being lectured on this uh, model when I was an architecture student. I think it's the only time food came up in my entire architectural career. And I found it phenomenally dull. I couldn't think why they were bothering to tell us any of this. It's much more interesting if you relate it to a real city. And uh, that's what I've done. I've actually done a little quiz here. These are four famous rivers with famous cities on them. I'm just wondering if anyone can recognize any of them. Feel free to shout out. I hear New York. Which one do you think is New York? Yep, absolutely. That's a, that's a sort of um, bonus prize for you. Anyone else? What's top left? Yes, my home city that I, I may not get back to tomorrow because the Eurostar isn't running. Bottom, bottom left, any guesses? Yeah. Did somebody say Himalayas? Yeah, absolutely. You're good. Yeah, I promise we're not working together. Yes, it's the Ganges with Karl Kush at the bottom. And then bottom right, any ideas? It's the Yangtze. With, but I'm, I'm impressed. And I promise we didn't confer. We've never met in our lives. Anyway, the point of this is that um, it is just a very basic point, but actually everything I'm going to say to you tonight is going to be blindingly obvious. And you're going to think... Of course, well, she just keeps telling us things that are blindingly obvious, but actually, oddly, they're, they're only blindingly obvious once you've, as it were, stated them. Um, which is that most cities in the pre-industrial world, as I said before, evolved around rivers for all the reasons that I said. But of course, rivers brought nutrition down from the mountains or from the inland, and the deltas themselves where the river slowed down was the most fertile place. So it's just a very, very logical place to build a city because the fertile land was right next door. Of course, as those cities now expand, they build on the best soil. So that's what we have going on globally. But it's a fascinating relationship and a very, very fundamental one. The other thing to say is that the area around those cities, because of course they were all exploiting the local hinterland and using the rivers to bring the food in, um, is a watershed. So it's the river's watershed, but it's also the city's food shed, if you like. So it's just a very primary geographical relationship. Now, obviously, um, we have a city on a river, um, and not only on a river, but on a wonderful series of canals. And uh, I love coming to the Netherlands, actually, because not only are the, many of the cities fantastically preserved, so you can actually sort of walk around and you can really imagine how they fed themselves um, in the pre-industrial era, but also there are these fantastic maps, like this Blau map from 1652, I'm sure you all know it, but if you look closely, and I'm now looking closely because I actually can see this easier than I can see that, you can see market gardens in a kind of triangle up to the north. You can see some market gardens inside the city as well. You can obviously see a kind of, you know, river coming in, you know, left and right of you and passing right through the city. And just south of where we are now, and I'm sure you all know where that is, um, is the fish market was the fish market for obvious reasons, you know. Um, and then, in fact, again, sort of just to the left of that uh, is the town hall. So you have, again, the, the civic order, you know, this town hall overlooking the most important thing, which is where the food's coming in and who's buying it, and it all had to happen in the open. And then just next to that is the, uh, I'm going to pronounce this really badly, but the, um, the goose market, the... Can't hear you, but anyway, I, um, try, try again. I have to do it in unison. Anyway, it, I think it's an absolutely beautiful image, and you can imagine, I mean, I couldn't actually work out. I couldn't find a street. I found a ham street. Actually, the next slide's better for this. And you, I mean, it's a beautiful, beautiful image. You, you know, really, you can just see, and windmills on the edge, of course, because you have to grind the grain. I mean, it's just a beautiful image for, 
I mean, once you sort of start seeing with food-shaped glasses, which is what I do now, it's all about, again, food and the relationship between the city and the countryside. Um, in fact, if I... Here we go. Now, yes, the Hansermarkt, is that roughly... Yeah, OK, thank you, yes. So, Goose Market. And then if you look just to the south of there, there's a Backer a Street. Backerstrasse, yeah. And then next door, there's Ham... Sorry, wrong again. Backerstrasse, yeah, yeah. And Strat. That's it, sorry, Strat. Yes, exactly. Sorry, I, it's, it's not quite... And then Hamstrat next door. Um, so, you know, many streets and spaces, and of course the, the, the Nerder, Nerder, was the, uh, the grain market, it was, uh, and, and so on. So we have this, in Utrecht, as we do in all, actually, uh, medieval and, and pre-industrial cities, this absolutely fantastic relationship between geography, the food coming in, you can imagine the animals walking in from the south, hitting the, the um, you know, going up, being slaughtered somewhere, the grain coming in, probably almost certainly by river, uh, and then being traded in the Nerder, and, and the whole thing overseen by civic order in the form of the town hall, and then spiritual order in the form of the church. And this is absolutely fundamental to the order of the city. This is really how cities were built. And this is also the meaning of them. So it all happens around the marketplace in a very, very visible and wonderful way. Um, and in fact, I just found this, this online. I just, you know, sort of noodling around trying to look for amazing images. But this is an image of the fish market when it actually still had a, a hat on, which I think is absolutely fantastic. Um, so again, it just gives you an idea of, you know, how fundamental food was to the public life of the city, not only shaping it physically, but also bringing people into an open space, very often the only open space in the city, to buy food, which of course was very necessary, but also under the watchful eye of the city. And this is what I was trying to get across again in my beginning slide of the allegory of the effects of good government is a city that really makes sure that it controls its food system. That's really what it's all about. Um, and then, of course, public life comes off the back of that. So um, here we go. Now, I mean, that's a very, very brief, I might have felt brief, but um, it was, believe me, um, sort of discussion of the relationship between food and cities in the pre-industrial world. And, of course, with the arrival of the railways, and I use this image, I love this image, I only just recently found it, and what I love about it is that the Liverpool to Manchester railway was the first railway ever built. It was actually built to take coal from Liverpool, which was a port, uh, into Manchester, which is inland, which is an industrial city. And if you look at the four layers of carriages and what they're carrying, the top one's got posh people in it, so they're in carriages. The next one down's got poor people, so they're in the open and breathing in all the smoke and fumes. The next one's down's got basically stuff, coal, you know, uh, industrial equipment, which is the whole point of the railway, it was why it was built. But beautifully, from my point of view, the fourth one down has got farm animals in it. And if you think about what that means, this is really, this is a game changer. If you, know, if you like, if the discovery of grain as a food source was, was the first convulsive moment in, that really gave birth to urbanism, the, dis, the, the arrival of railways in the 19th century was the moment that urbanism really was able to take off because... What railways did is they emancipated cities from geography. So everything I've been talking to you about up to now is about the relationship between cities and geography and, and their ability to feed themselves by sea or river or whatever. Now, of course, if you can bring the food in quickly and over long distances cheaply, the relationship is broken. So unlike the medieval city where the animals would walk in and be slaughtered visibly in front of you, uh, the animals could now be slaughtered where they were raised, they didn't have to walk to the city anymore, and they came in as meat. Point of that being that people no longer saw animals in the city, they no longer saw what they were eating, because it just came in kind of as a lamb chop or a fillet steak, or as we discovered recently in England as a horse, um, or a bit of one. Anyway, um, so three things really change here fundamentally, and I just wanted, as it were, make them clear for you because they're, they have repercussions that sort of extend to everything else that I'm going to say. The first is, as I said, the emancipation of cities from geography, the fact that cities could now grow any size, any shape, in anywhere. Secondly, the fact that food, having been highly, highly visible in the pre-industrial city, now starts to become invisible, the change that we spoke about at the beginning. 
And last but not least, urban authorities that up to this point had really understood the necessity of controlling and making visible the food system now wiped a sort of respective brow of relief and said, thank goodness we don't have to worry about the food problem anymore because the food industries are so good at doing it for us. Thank you very much. Off you go, guys. So control of food goes from civic uh, or political control to commercial more or less free-for-all. Um, huge implications which we're still sort of dealing with today. So what do those look like? I mean, this is just three maps of London. 1840, the year the railways came to London, it's more or less, it's a still a very dense blob, like I was saying all pre-industrial cities were, um, barely grown since medieval times. And then 60 years later and uh, then 30 years after that, the thing is kind of spreading out along these tendrils created by the railways. Um, and it becomes a sort of large metropolitan splodge uh, that you couldn't possibly hope to feed from one or two little markets that everybody walked to in the middle of the city. So game changing. Of course, as cities like London were spreading, the food that fed them was also spreading. And in fact, the interesting thing about railways is it wasn't so much necessarily about bringing food into cities that was really radical. It was actually opening up the food productive territories such as America, Australia, South America, and so on. So that these marginal lands that had, you know, such as the American Midwest that had never really been good for much apart from cattle ranching could suddenly be turned over into grain production because the grain could now be transported easily to the coast by rail, um, and therefore exported all over the world. There was a huge and almost immediate surplus of grain, and this is where an interesting split occurs, because up to that point, grain, the relationship between grain and, and people, but basically most urbanites left, lived off bread. Most people lived off bread or other, other forms of, of grain, grain food. But when there was this enormous surplus, people got the brilliant idea of feeding the grain to animals instead of to people and then exporting the animals, which is a much higher value product. So we have the beginning of meat packing, which is what the Chicago Union stockyards were. And by this time in the 1880s, they were already processing 17 million animals a year. So I mean, it's a huge market. Um, and huge implications as well that I'll come on to in a little while. Now, of course, railways were just the beginning, the car follows on, and you start to get these kind of weird landscapes that some architects like to argue are not really cities at all. Um, they are in my terms, but interestingly, they are, if you like, the radical reverse of those kind of early cities that I showed you. In other words, they're about as undense as you can possibly get. It is the space of the car. Nobody in their right minds walks in a kind of landscape like this. Instead, you get into your car, you drive to a box on the outskirts, and you come back with all of this weird stuff that you found in the box and wonder why on earth you bought it and what on earth it really is and sort of puzzle over it a bit and stick it in your fridge and wait for it to go off. Um, so this really is the beginning of the sort of our relationship with food sort of getting completely split apart. She hasn't got a clue what's in there. You can just tell by the look on her face. Or, or that she even intended to buy half of that stuff. Of course, the food has had to be denatured because it's had to travel such a long way to get into the city. This is the beginning of processed food. In fact, supermarkets were invented by American food processors to sell their products. They wanted to sell them cheaply. And of course, the thing about processed food as opposed to fresh food is that it can stay on a shelf for three months and just wait until somebody eventually wants to buy it. So you don't have to have that human everyday, how's your son doing in school type conversation that people used to have when they bought food. And therefore, it's much, much, much cheaper to sell the food because there's no human, human involvement in, in, the, in, in the deal. So it's a sort of um, it's a eradicate the human kind of um, way of buying and selling food. So I say you get these boxes. And if you think about it, it's a really fascinating reversal of the, by then, thousands of years old relationship between food and cities. Instead of food coming into the middle of the city and indeed the whole city evolving around the food system and the way food was bought and sold, we've now got food outside the city in a box and people leaving the city to go and buy the food. So the food starting to obey its own order, its own logic, which is to do with food distribution and nothing to do with cities at all. Obviously, it's got to be near enough to people for them to come out, but the food no longer comes to the people, the people go to the food. And the result of that is that in the middle of cities, instead of having vibrant public spaces with everybody kind of, as it were, 
going and meeting one another and you know, having a social time around food, we actually get what I call the eviscerated city. In other words, this is actually a map of New York. But you can see the red bits are food deserts, which are designated as areas where people live more than 500 meters away from a source of fresh food. And of course, in the bottom of Manhattan, in the posh bits, there's plenty of food. But in the poor neighborhoods, such as the Bronx and Harlem and so on, you, you have pretty much one big food desert. In other words, there's no fresh food there at all. And these are also areas of high poverty, high crime rates, obviously high obesity, type 2 diabetes, and all the rest of it. So there's a very, very powerful correlation between these kind of areas of deprivation and the way food maps onto it. Um, and this, if you like, is the distribution of food that you get if you abandon food to, to free um, market forces, because the food goes to where people have got money to buy it, basically. It doesn't go anywhere else. Now, it's very, very interesting. I mean, I, I, people like me kind of love the horse meat or horse gate scandal because it sort of exposes everything that we knew was going on anyway. Um, and that we can, you know, it gets a bit boring trying to persuade people is, is going on. So there's been a huge rumpus about this, particularly in the UK, because we don't actually eat horse in the UK. I mean, so it's, you can imagine, well, maybe you can't, but people have been doing a lot of soul searching. And, and there's a very fascinating statistic, actually, which is that up until Horsegate, one in three meals in the UK eaten was a ready meal. In other words, a meal that basically somebody else has cooked for you. Two weeks after Horsegate, one in three people in the UK said that they had stopped eating ready meals altogether. So that gives you some idea of the impact this has had. Now, the really interesting thing is that, and as I said earlier, you can trace these kind of flows of food, you know, in terms of people's attitudes and how, you know, food fits into the culture. The image on the left is from 100 years ago. It's from 1906, and it's Upton Sinclair's The Jungle, which was a shocking expose of the practices in the Chicago Union stockyards. And basically, appalling conditions, both for the animals and for people working there, there were a lot of industrial accidents. People would get slightly too close to the animal processing machinery and lose limbs and things. I mean, it was really, really appalling. And there was an absolute revulsion and outrage, and people stopped eating processed meat then. And there's an interesting response to that, which is that there had to be a response from the food industry. They said, we're going to clean up our act. We're going to kind of do it all right now. It's all going to be cool. And of course, that worked for a while. And then everyone forgot about it and went back to business as usual. And these things just recur. It's fascinating. I mean, I don't know whether any of you saw, but last week there were huge full page ads, probably not here, but in, in the UK from Tesco, basically saying, what burgers have taught us? And they said they're going to completely change the way they operate and do it differently from now on. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to hold my breath. Anyway, industrialized food culture, as I say, obesity, crazy diets, huge amounts of waste. We don't really value food. We can't see it. We externalize its true costs. We don't really pay the true costs of, of this food. Squeamishness, which is a word that I know doesn't really translate very well in Dutch, but basically means kind of fear and revulsion at the same time. It's kind of Lick! kind of reaction to food, um, which was why we have kind of see-through packaging on our ready meals so you can see what's in it in our country, and so on. Um, so it's a really, really uh, dysfunctional system. And as I say, it's an extremely expensive system. I mean, this, the, 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 the extraordinary thing that we've bought, really, over the last 150 years is the idea that industrial production produces cheap food. I mean, yeah, it might look cheap when you're sort of only paying, you know, 30 cents for what you think is a hamburger, and it turns out to be... <laughs> but, um, you know... <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Well, I, I you know, <laughs> now you know what it's like inside my head. Um, but also, <laughs> just, um, but anyway, uh, but also the, the costs that we don't really think about at all. So, I mean, just, just to give you some examples, 20% of global arable land is degraded or basically lost, desertified, because of these kinds of monocultural, very, very high-intensity farming practices. 30% um, of global greenhouse gas emissions are directly related either to food and farming or to the deforestation which is associated with it. 70% of fresh water globally is uh, directly used in agriculture, but unfortunately a lot of that is 
uh, unreplaceable water, so it's ancient aquifers and things that are going dry, or rivers that are running dry. Um, the image of the, the rather, I have to say, delicious looking joint of beef, uh, bottom left, just represents the fact that, weirdly, this, this invention of meatpacking has now sort of, as it were, locked urbanism and carniv carnivorism together. And in fact, what we're seeing globally is that as uh, city dwellers rise, and the number of city dwellers is predicted to double by 2050, we're seeing a sort of exactly parallel rise in the amount of meat being consumed. And of course, that meat is almost all of it uh, raised on grain that we could be eating directly. And indeed, we could be feeding 10 times as many people with the grain if it didn't go through an animal first. So there's enormous implications for that. Of course, we've all heard of peak oil. So when I tell you that we're actually using 10 calories of energy to produce every calorie of food that we consume in the West, that's sort of an interesting statistic to roll around in the back of your head. And of course, we're losing rural populations because people are simply unable to carry on living in, in the countryside or have been told, in the case of the Chinese, that it's no longer modern and they're going to be put into a city instead. And we have 1.4 million rural migrants coming to cities every week globally at the moment. You're looking at your watch worriedly. I'm about a quarter of the way through. <laughs> um, anyway, so I'll speed up. But there was a, a very, very fascinating study done in the Center for Environmental Studies in India that reckoned that if you internalize the true cost of a hamburger made from beef raised on land that would have been recently cleared of rainforest, uh, that a hamburger ought to cost $200, not 30 cents. So that just gives you some idea of the uneven playing field that we've got when it comes to the economics of food. Now, this diet is going global. There are many reasons for this. The basic reasons are that this is a diet that evolved in America because it was a kind of lowest common denominator diet. Basically, it was a diet that had all the garlic that the Italian immigrants liked or the paprika that the Hungarians liked taken out because every special flavor enhancer in one culture was revolting to other people. So in order to get on with your neighbors, you basically took it all out and stuck in salt, sugar, and fat, which are the only three flavor enhancers that nobody seems to object to. And of course, the one thing that was available in America that was not available in Europe was vast amounts of meat. So just chuck the meat in, big portions, salt, sugar, and fat, hey presto. Um, we have the American uh, diet, which of course is now hugely bound up with commercial interests and is being uh, aggressively marketed globally. So this is, if you like, my Armageddon slide. I mean, this is kind of as bad as it gets, really. Uh, and I'm going to spend the rest of my time trying to discuss what we might do about it. <laughs> How long have I got? Um, so, I mean, the first sort of crumb of comfort that I can offer you is that, you know, the issues that we face now, which are indeed severe, are not new. And in fact, it's always been understood as a, a major problem of how to feed cities. And in fact, utopianism, which is, if you like, our best tradition of thinking in a multidisciplinary way about how we should feed ourselves and indeed can feed ourselves, has a very interesting approach. It's, you could say, back to the city-state model, which was the first model that cities came up with naturally. So both Thomas More's Utopia, which you can see the frontispiece of on the left, or Ebenezer Howard's Garden Cities of Tomorrow, which you can see on the right, uh, are basically a series of interconnected, semi-independent city-states so dense blobs of urbanity surrounded by productive hinterland linked to one another, uh, in the case of Thomas More by foot. In other words, they were all arranged a day's walk from one another. And in Ebenezer Howard, Howard's case by railway, the idea being that you had enough density of people within easy reach of one another that, as Ebenezer Howard put it, uh, you could have a decent symphony orchestra. You know, in other words, how do you, you know, somebody's got to play the tuba. Where are they going to come from? So they're very interesting models. If you like, Howard is more with railways, effectively. They're otherwise exactly the same idea. And many, many other utopians have come up with a similar proposal. I mean, today I would say that, you know, the, probably the closest thing to a utopian approach to the question of how we're going to feed cities is the vertical farm. Does everyone here know what vertical farms are, or does anyone not know? Anyone not know? Anyone at all not know? That's amazing. This many people all know what, wow, the world's changed. That's incredible. Anyway, that's, uh, 10 years ago, the whole room would have gone, eh? um, so that's amazing. Anyway, 
vertical farms. So you know the idea is basically to feed the city from within the city. Well, I'm afraid I'm here to tell you that it doesn't work. Why? Because of the urban paradox. You can't feed a city from within itself because that's what we call the countryside. That is the essence of the paradox. And in fact, I did some maths. I worked out that even if Londoners ate 2,000 calories a day only, stopped wasting food and didn't eat animals, you would still need 2,000 vertical farms, 100 meters by 100 meters and 30 meters high to feed London. My question is, where would London have gone? Uh, and if there's any architects in the room, um, you will probably recognize this wonderful uh, scheme of Le Corbusier's for basically decimating the center of Paris and sticking a bunch of tower blocks in it. Uh, and I think it's probably the best vision that I know of what Paris would look like if it really took vertical farming seriously. <laughs> um, uh, it's not my idea of what, where we should go. So there are no one-size-fits-all solutions. That's my point. And in fact, the very word utopia tells you that because it's got a double derivation. It's kind of like a joke word, really. It can either mean a good place or no place. Um, so basically, it's fabulous, but we can't have it, which I remember being rather depressed by when I was researching Utopia for my book and just thought, well, actually, that's really tragic because if that's the best tradition we've got of thinking how we should live and we can't have it, where does that leave us? By then, I'd spent seven years looking at food, and I thought, well, actually, we do already have a kind of space that you could express in Greek as Cytopia, food place, because by then I'd really sort of, it had really hit home to me how profoundly our lives are shaped by food in every way. So we already live in Cytopia. We just live in a very bad Cytopia that we've never really thought about, shaped by the likes of, if you like, Aldi and Little and Albert Hein and so on, and, and not by any kind of social vision. So my question now and then was, what would it be like if we actually took food as a creative, cooperative, multidisciplinary tool and used it positively to shape the world? How would that work? That's really the idea I'm sort of exploring all the time now. Well, to start off with, I mean, we have to think of food as a flow. It is a flow. It flows through our lives, through our countryside, our spaces, uh, and, you know, and shapes everything as it goes. But it's actually much more complicated in this diagram because actually every element of the food's journey from the country to the city and back again is linked to every other one by a whole series of things, beliefs, prejudices, what my granny did and so on. So really you have to understand this as a hugely complex interconnected web effectively, wh whichever way you look at it. That's what we're dealing with is complexity. And it's interesting if you look at the reality of the food system. It's a very interesting study done by Jan Willem Grieving on the left that shows the huge degree of consolidation within the food industry that we currently have. So that, for instance, in six European city, uh, countries that he studied, he worked out that three million farmers and 160 million consumers, um, their relationship was controlled by just 110 supermarket buying desks. And this was done about 10 years ago, so it's probably less than that now. That gives you some idea of the level of control that those supermarket buying desks have got. And it always struck me as interesting that, you know, there was a very famous essay done in the 1960s called The City is Not a Tree by Christopher Alexander in which he critiqued modern city planning and said you can't design cities like pinball machines, you know, with people eating there and sleeping there and having fun over there and just all going round. Actually, it's much more complex than that. And he drew what he called a semi-lattice, which is the shape on the right. My point is that, you know, if we look at the food system we've got and we look at what, if you like, a, a vibrant society might look like, uh, they don't match. One has the appearance of democracy and one is clearly increasingly monopolistic. And in fact, I took the precaution of drawing, you know, the kind of food flows onto those diagrams and actually, you know, it really is like a tree. Um, and in fact, a food system should not be a tree, but the, the industrial food system does look like it. And if we want to do anything about it, what we've got to do is join the roots of that tree. You know, so if you imagine the roots are, well, it doesn't really matter whether you imagine they're consumers or producers. If they're separated by just one trunk, they don't have any real connection. But if you do connect them up, then all of a sudden you've got something that looks a lot more like a democratic society. And I believe you can't actually discuss food in the absence of society or society in the absence of food. They're absolutely enmeshed. One is the other. 
Uh, we got together in the first place uh, around food. Food is absolutely the, the fundamental building block of society. So how are we going to do this thing which is so easy to draw on a diagram? I mean, the good news is it's kind of already happening to a certain extent. I mean, it's interesting. I just sort of, I thought, well, let's have a look and see how the food's coming into Utrecht um, at the moment. Now, I mean, obviously, I've, I, I haven't spent 10 years studying Utrecht's food systems, more like 10 minutes, but nevertheless. Um, if you go onto Google Maps and you type in supermarkets Utrecht, they, the lovely people show you all the supermarkets and what they are. And then you can just map them on. So you've got, you know, obviously Albert Hein, you've got Little, you kind of got, you know, most of the obvious ones. And if you think of where that food's actually coming from, of course, it's not coming from the landscape that you clearly still have around the city. Uh, it's coming from all over the world, of course. And in fact, most of the, the food, I mean, as has always been the case in the Netherlands, comes through the Netherlands and then goes off to the UK and people like me. So this is what the food flow looks like geographically, if you like. Um, and it's very interesting. I mean, I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, have heard of slow food. Must have done, I would think. Yes. The interesting thing about slow food is that, you know, I mean, it, and, and actually Carlo Petrini was very clear that it was not, as it were, a critique of fast food. He just said that actually it's just a different way of thinking about food. But if you think about the food system as I've been describing it, it really is about efficiency in delivery. And in fact, they're obsessed with efficiency in, in every aspect of the industrial food system. But why do we want food to, as it were, whoosh, pass through our lives like that when you actually consider that food is not only nourishing to our bodies, but also nourishing to our relationships, to society, to the way that we feel. You know, it's about the good life, really. So isn't it weird that we've kind of designed a system where food more or less kind of passes us by or is invisible or spends its time in our company for 30 seconds, you know, too busy to eat, <laughs> right, on to something else, you know, I mean, the way we eat now. So I thought, well, isn't it interesting if you look historically at, for instance, how mills used to slow down the flow of a river in order to make use of it? It's a kind of very beautiful image of the way, you know, what I think we need to do with the food system now. And, of course, permaculture 40 years ago talked about precisely this kind of approach. I really am going to try to speed up now because I can see lots of people in the front looking at their watches, which is always a bad sign. But anyway, <laughs> so... Um, all of these situations to do with food, they're all opportunities. They're all sort of potential decisions where we can go one way or the other. You know, do we put cows on grass and then eat the cows, which is, to my mind, the only sane way of eating cow because cows can eat grass and we can't. Seems like a beautiful thing. And also you get fabulous views out of it. Or do we have these concentrated animal feeding operations with 160,000 cows all kind of sick and pumped full of drugs and walking around in their own poo? Um, you know, do we allow the natural social capital of the buying and selling of food to express itself? Or do we go into these weird boxes on the outskirts where, you know, these whole things are designed to exclude the human? Let's cut the human out of the food chain. Do we, in fact, have people who, as we say in the UK, know their onions, which basically is an expression just meaning no stuff, no, you know, how to do stuff. But obviously, in this case, this woman is staring at a pile of raw vegetables and looks, gives every appearance of knowing what they actually are. Whereas I'm sure some of you have heard that Jamie Oliver in our country uh, famously went to a school in the north of England and showed a bunch of leeks and potatoes to a bunch of, frankly, terrified school children who'd never seen a raw vegetable in their lives, um, which just <laughs> tells you everything you need to know about the UK food system. And I mentioned the one in three meals in the UK. Uh, you know, this is a man basically boiling pasta for half of Birmingham on, on the right. Um, you know, do we, I mean, not time to go into it today, but I'd love to, but, you know, basically the meal is the fundamental building block of society and you can read tracks going back thousands of years about how in fundamentally important it is to learn. It's the, civili it's, it's the core of civilization, basically. So what does it tell us about where we're going when I tell you that 19% of meals that are eaten in America now are now eaten in a car? I just find it absolutely astonishing. You know, what, what are we doing? You know, what are we trying to achieve with this weird rushing thing? So there you go. And look how happy the dog looks. Um, 
you know, and this business of not valuing food, we waste up to half the food we produce. This is clearly a sort of a society that does not value the most important thing in it, which is food. That obviously is not sort of directly to do with, you know, abstract concepts like love and so on. So my point is, you know, slow food or whatever you want to call it, fast food, they all feed into a kind of a decision process and they pop out the bottom. Which ones actually relate to our idea of a good life? or a good society? These are the questions we have to ask. You know, in other words, the food system should serve a vision of society, not the other way around. Obviously, there are times in history when people have valued food. It's when there's a war on, it's when your Cuba and the Soviet Union collapses, or it's when you're living in Detroit and Ford Motor Company decides to go somewhere else. You know, in other words, you are desperate. And in those times, the value of food skyrockets. People get it and they start growing their own again and exploiting the natural latent um, fertility that all cities have. Much, much more to say about that in another life <laughs> or, or, or later. Um, you know, there's a very interesting study in the UK about the, the value of local food webs. They've actually analyzed who's producing what and all the social benefits that come in with it. And they are the Council for the Protection of Rural England, the people that actually say, eat the view, work out that there's a relationship between the landscape and what you eat. This idea of co-producing, in other words, let's not just be passive lemons who receive food, you know, as we stick it down and just go on and do something else, but let's actually go out, meet the farmers halfway, you know, share their risk with community-supported agriculture, set up co-ops like Park Slope Food Co-op that's been going now for 40 years on the left. A group of hippies didn't like what they saw happening in the food system in the 1970s, got together, set up basically a cooperative food market. They worked there for four hours a month each in exchange for much cheaper products. Uh, and also they do long-term deals with farmers. Uh, the food salt teams in Leuven and in other places in Flanders, which is just householders getting together and directly dealing with farmers and who drop them off in their kind of, this is a garage where one of the farmers uh, drops their food off and so on. Um, going back to what I said at the beginning, understanding that cities are still actually, a lot of them, in a very, very productive geographical situation, and actually how can you connect the city back to its geography, because we are entering what I call a neo-geographical age, when we're going to hit peak oil, peak water, peak land, peak just about everything, and we're actually going to have to look at different ways of feeding ourselves. So now is the time to be thinking about these things and acting, so analyzing the latent potential of the region, food planning. It's absolutely astonishing to me, actually, that until about 10 years ago, the discipline of planning, which had existed for about 150 years, did not include food as a subject for its consideration. Just like, oh, food? No, that's just something that comes in. But let's plan everything to do with the transport system and, you know, public squares and walkways in the air and oh, I don't know what they were thinking. Anyway, um... Finally, we've got the planning community recognizing that food might be something they want to think about again. And there's a very, very fast, rapidly growing recognition of its importance. Uh, cities like New York, Toronto, London, creating food strategies and so on, which is fantastic. As I said, I call it neo-geography, and it's really interesting. There are live projects. This is one I'm involved in in New York, uh, which is basically joining... Brooklyn uh, back to Manhattan where if, if you look in the issue uh, on the picture on the on the left you can see the cows lining up on the Brooklyn side close to you waiting to be ferried across to where Robert LaVolva uh, is pointing to where he has set up uh, New Amsterdam Market as he calls it on the site of what was the uh, city's wholesale fish market, Fulton Fish Market. And there's a battle going on right now, in fact, going to be decided on Friday about the future of this area and whether the city's going to allow a mall to be built there or whether they're going to keep it open for the future development of wholesale markets. So it's very critical stuff. And these battles are being fought all over the place. You've got another one for Smithfield Market in London, the market that's been on the same site for over a 1,000 years. So Toronto Food Policy Council, as I say, 20 years old, really fantastic. The first embedded food policy council in any city. Many, many inspirational uh, projects. I mean, I said vertical farming doesn't work. I don't mean that it isn't a good idea. I mean, it just has to work at an appropriate scale, in an appropriate place, growing appropriate food, which basically means, top left, greenhouses on roofs. That's it. But it's a good idea to that extent. Um, or top right, Ben Flanner, this absolutely inspirational uh, 
actually he was trained as an engineer, but he's started up Brooklyn Grange Farm, the first farm in New York. Oh, this is serious watch, watch tapping going on now. I'm very near the end. Um, I'm going to pass over that. I'm just going to say that um, strengthening the rural infrastructure is as important as wondering what we're going to do in cities. You know, so it's not just about what goes on in cities, but actually reconnecting to people that are out in the countryside. Obviously, mobile phones and internets make that far easier. Bye-bye, Boris. Mapping, making visible a fantastic project done in London by Sustain, the Alliance for Better Food and Farming, literally naming and shaming boroughs about how well they're doing on various things like school food and so on. And a global food movement, which does give me hope, which does exist, which is growing the whole time, which is about all sorts of things like nudging, behavioral economics, taxation, planning, trying to put things in the right direction. Last but one slide. You know, my question, as I say, is that, you know, we already live in a Cytopia. What would a better Cytopia look like? The beautiful thing about Cytopia, by the way, is that it doesn't have to be perfect. Small things make a difference as well as big things. And, and all of us can start making better Cytopias now or from now on. That's the beauty of it. And it's a very collaborative and wonderful thing. All you've got to do, this is my final slide, is learn to see through food. And the rest follows. Thank you very, very much indeed. Thank you.